What's up, Channing? I really think we could use some banter between the hosts, you know, like we do in Channel 8. You are absolutely right, but who you... can we get? Mm. Perhaps I can help. Hey, Krista, you ready for this? Bring it on. All right, prompter's up. If you can stand right there, and we'll get this thing rolling. You ready for this? Let's do this thing. episode of Nerd Central. We have a packed show this week with our next installments of Dragon Corner, Heart of the Cards, Look Back, and Dead on Arrival. But first, let's introduce my co-host, Krista Ott. Krista, why don't you tell our awesome viewers what brought you here to co-host Nerd Central? I joined Film Club and I had an audition there and it went really well. And then I got approached to join Nerd Central, and I was like, heck yeah, I want to join Nerd <laughs> Central, and now here I am. Well, awesome. It is so great to have you. Well, you want to take us to the news of the week? Sure. Let's talk about the news of the week. In the span of a week, the Marvel Netflix shows went from four down to only two. Maybe they are now feeling the effects of Thanos' snap? On October 15th, Netflix canceled Iron Fist after just two seasons on the service. Four days later, Luke Cage got the axe. The cancellation of Iron Fist comes at no surprise, as the two seasons were not the best to come out of the universe. Luke Cage's cancellation does come at a shock, as the writers of the series were six months into writing a third season, with series star Mike Coulter slated to return. The cancellation comes at a strange time as Marvel dropped the third season of Daredevil just a couple of weeks ago. It is unclear if both cancellations are setting the stage for a Heroes for Hire series, in which Iron Fist and Luke Cage are founding members of that group, or if this cancellation is just to have a revival of the shows on the Disney streaming service. If we find out, we will be sure to let you all know. Now, let's take it to the next installments of Dragon Corner and Heart of the Cards. What do you guys have for us this week? Hello and welcome back to Dragon Corner. This week we're talking about the titular MacGuffins, the Dragon Balls themselves. Well over 100 million years before age, the Dragon God Zalama created seven great orange magical spheres about half the size of Neptune. Each Super Dragon Ball was adorned with a number of red stars that look the same from every angle. If all seven balls are gathered together, a dragon emerges, and the gatherer will be granted any wish they desire. After the wish is granted, the balls scatter between universes 6 and 7, and Super Shenron cannot grant another wish until the lifespan of a cockroach or one Earth year has passed. At some unknown point in history, Namekians from both universes 6 and 7 broke off pieces of the Super Dragon Balls to study them, and eventually created their own versions, the Namekian Dragon Balls. These balls are about the size of basketballs, and collecting all seven of them grants the user the chance to summon the Dragon of Dreams, Horunga. Horunga can grant three wishes, but there are a few caveats to his power. As a safety precaution, a secret password and the summoning incantation must be performed in the Namekian tongue. While the idea is that the user can be granted any three wishes they desire, only one person can be revived from the dead by each wish. This limitation was later removed and Paranga cannot revive those who have died of natural causes. These wishes reset every Namekian year, which is 130 Earth days. Although the gods were initially angry about this upset in the natural order, the Namekians were considered a peaceful race, and only used their wish orbs for harmless or small-scale wishes, so they were allowed to continue. 519 years before the events of Dragon Ball Super Broly, or age 261, a massive climate change hit Namek causing violent storms and drought. Namekians survived solely on water, so this caused a massive extinction event. One Namekian, the genius Katas, sent his son away from the planet to save him. Only one person survived the drought, but because Namekians reproduce asexually by spitting out eggs, the race was saved and Namek was restored. 
Unfortunately, the son of Katas was forgotten, and Namekians no longer had access to space travel. Landing on Yunzabet Heights on Earth, the son of Katas spent the majority of his adolescence living in his spaceship, before venturing out into the world. After awakening his potential power and becoming a powerful warrior known as a Super Namekian, he would audition for the role of Earth's protector, but discovered that the evil of man had tainted him. In order to obtain the position, he used a fission technique to split into two beings, the good Kami and the evil King Piccolo. In a bid to take over the world, King Piccolo used his mutant offspring to start a massive war in age 461, before being sealed in an electric rice cooker by Master Mutaito's evil containment wave. In Age 470, Kami created Earth's own set of Dragon Balls, which came with their own rules. The Dragon Balls only grant one wish, this was later changed to three, cannot grant the same wish twice, and can only be used for mass resurrection if all the parties have been dead for less than a year. This uses two wishes instead of one. The Earth Dragon Shenron also cannot kill anyone unless their power is less than or equal to the power of the Wisher. In age 753, King Piccolo is freed from his imprisonment and begins a new reign of terror. Goku is able to defeat him, but not before he births a successor, Piccolo Jr. Piccolo would popularize the anime trend of former rivals having a change of heart, joining forces with Goku to train his son and save the world. During Frieza's hunt for the Namekian Dragon Balls, Piccolo would use Namekian fusion to assimilate the warrior Nail, and when greater threats endanger the Earth, he would refuse with Kami as well, passing the title of Guardian to a new generation. We'll talk a little more about Namek and Dragon Balls next week when we cover the space Napoleon Hitler of the universe himself, Frieza. See you next time on Dragon Corner. Hello and welcome to Nerd Central's Heart of the Cards with your host Bradley Justice. I will be taking a deep dive into the anime juggernaut that is Yu-Gi-Oh! Or what I like to call, The Friendship Show. Don't mention it, Serenity. I had a great time hanging out with you. Me too, and thanks for going through all the trouble to bring me to Battle City. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing right now, Serenity. Wow, I feel like the luckiest person in the world to have a friend as awesome as you, Tristan. Did she say friend? Oh man, I'm stuck in the friend zone! This week I will review Yu-Gi-Oh!'s newest movie, Dark Side of Dimensions. This movie was released in Japan 2016 and the United States in 2017, 13 years after the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series. For a lot of people it seems that Yu-Gi-Oh! is not as popular today as it once was, so why release a movie in 2017? But the fact is Yu-Gi-Oh! is just as popular today than most people think. Even recently a super valuable card was sold for $3,500. The only problem was it was a counterfeit and the seller was tracked down and arrested. Yu-Gi-Oh! is taken very seriously today. Now onto the review of the movie. With the movie only being about two years old, this is your spoiler warning. It starts off a year after the departure of Atem, the pharaoh. Yugi and his friends are finishing up high school talking about their dreams. Kaiba, on the other hand, has been up to a lot more. You can see early on that Kaiba has created a new dual disc system, a Kaiba Corp satellite, and a giant elevator to the satellite from his company on the ground. I don't know if all this stuff is possible to make in about a year, but hey, if anyone can do it, it's super billionaire Kaiba. The plot of this movie is for Kaiba to bring back the pharaoh so he can prove to himself and the world that he is the best duelist ever. So he retrieves the puzzle and starts to build it. While this is happening, the main antagonist, Diva or Aigami, is trying to stop the pharaoh from returning. Diva, a part of a group named the Plana, has the power to bend reality to the user's will, but if the pharaoh returns, the Plana will be gone forever. This gives Diva the motivation to kill Yugi and stop Kaiba from completing the puzzle. This movie is outstanding. Finally being able to enjoy one of my childhood shows as an adult. Going from wanting to be Joey who had his friends and the reputation of being a class clown to wanting to be Kaiba because he has the money and a freaking elevator to his own space station. I mean, he was able to design a dual disc that creates solid vision holograms from the user's memories. Also utilizing a cloud network so a duelist doesn't actually need cards to duel. They can just imagine the cards they need and play them. He even shows us off when he was able to summon all the Tormentor even though the card disappeared when the Pharaoh left. Kaiba will always be known as the screw the rules I have money type of guy. I also loved Yugi Moto's attitude in this movie. He showed that he's more mature and having the ability to hold his own without the Pharaoh. At one point he even tells Kaiba to back off and Kaiba listens. 
That would never happen in the show. The Dark Side of Dimensions was a great movie that I think came out at a great time to bring back the fans of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series. This has been Heart of the Cards with Bradley Justice. Stay tuned for more Nerd Central. Thanks, guys. We are going to take a short break, but when we come back, we will have our next installments of Look Back and Dead on Arrival. Plus, a champion will be crowned in our best Pixar film tournament on Showdown. Stay with us. So Krista, what's your favorite Pixar film? Honestly, I'm a big fan of Monsters, Inc. What about you? That's a tough one, because Pixar has a lot of great films, but I'd probably have to say Cars. Welcome back to Nerd Central. Let's talk about some more news that dropped last week. Netflix is retelling a classic and an Academy Award winning director is attached to make it. Pinocchio from the mind of Guillermo del Toro will be coming to the service. The Shape of Water director will be making this retelling animated but not like the 1940 Disney classic. Oh no. This retelling will be a stop motion musical. If you don't know the story of Pinocchio, First off, why don't you know the story of Pinocchio? And secondly, it's about a puppet who aspires to be a real boy. And spoilers, he does become one. Del Toro will write, produce, and direct the film, and will collaborate with Jim Henson Company to bring this film to life. No news on when we will get to see this retelling, but when that news comes available, we will be sure to let you all know. In DC film news, Wonder Woman 1984 has been delayed. According to Jeff Goldstein, president of Domestic Distribution, the move has put Wonder Woman smack dab in the middle of the summer season. A year ago, the first Wonder Woman film released the first week of June to roaring success. Warner Bros. just wants to replicate that for their follow-up. The film takes place in, you guessed it, 1984 with Gail Gadot's Wonder Woman as she tries to adapt to society after being secluded on Paradise Island for all those years. Patty Jenkins, the director of the first film, will return to direct 1984. This is not the first time the film has been moved. It was originally scheduled to release on December 13th, 2019, but moved to November 1st of the same year to avoid being released just one week before Star Wars Episode Nine. Smart move. The film will now be released on June 5th, 2020. In TV news, Amazon's Emmy-winning comedy series gave us a trailer and a premiere date for its upcoming season. The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel takes place in the 1950s and follow Emmy-winning actress Rachel Brosnahan, character Miriam Midge Maisel as she aspires to be a stand-up comedian after finding out her husband was having an affair with his secretary. The second season takes place a year after the first season, as Midge is determined to become a star on the stand-up circuit while juggling her new job as a switchboard operator. The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel will drop the second season exclusively on Amazon Prime Video on December 5th. Now, let's take it to the next installments of Look Back and Dead on Arrival. Take it away, guys. Hello, and welcome to Look Back a retrospective on shows that I used to love, to shows that I love in the present day. I'm Mikey, and in my opinion, three is a golden number. From dumb, smart, and greedy, TV shows, games, and toys, and the show for this week, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Ed, Ed, and Eddie is a cartoon that follows the old and true comedy method of dumb, smart, and greedy, to make a cartoon that can be enjoyed by pretty much anybody. From the dumb but hilarious Ed with 1D, the smart and mattered Ed with 2Ds, to the greedy and insane Eddie, this show screams crazy from the second it turns on. And from trying to get rid of a zit, to breaking the fourth wall over and over again, this show had comedy down to a science, and how it would use the three main characters along with a smattering of other characters to create a cul-de-sac neighborhood that is like no other. So whether the Eds are at Rolf's farm, where he tells stories of his homeland, or at the trailer park, trying to escape the Kanker sisters, who are infatuated with the Eds. What happens next is hard to be predicted. When it comes to material outside the TV show, Cartoon Network had it covered. 
with multiple toys made, the physical product market for the show was not overlooked. And in terms of video games, there were four games made, and besides being praised for the graphical style looking like the show, the games were not very spectacular. Now, the series only has one movie, and it served as a series finale for the entire show. Ed, Ed, and Eddie's big picture show was made for TV, and it focuses on the Eds trying to find a man mentioned throughout the show but never actually seen, Eddie's big brother. And with the show ending after this special, it's sad, but then again, the show ran for a whole decade, and it was hilarious as all get out. So I'm so happy this show exists, and I still laugh at the jokes the show makes even today. Next week, I think I'm going to Camp Wabanakwa to see an island that has a good amount of drama. Keep watching Nerd Central. Hello and welcome to Dead on Arrival, the segment where TV shows of one season or less get analyzed by your former teenage heartthrob, Cody Nance. At some point in their life, almost everybody thinks about how awesome it would be to be famous. But due to money issues and or lack of confidence, very few of these people actually go for it. Why am I reminding you of your broken hopes and dreams? Because we're looking at Zack Stone is gonna be famous. Written by and starring comedian Bo Burnham as the titular Zack Stone, the show is about the awkward summer that takes place between the end of high school and the beginning of college, but with a twist. See, Zack is so confident that someday he's going to be famous that he spent almost all of his savings to hire a camera crew to follow him around and document his life as a pre-celebrity, as he puts it. The show's layout is pretty simple, but effective. Every episode, Zack attempts a different method at becoming famous, including, but not limited to, being a recording artist, becoming a rebel, being the, a bachelor, aka the Zatchelor, a paranormal investigator, and more. There really is some great character development to find here too, as it is the last summer with his friends. He has to learn that he doesn't want to spend his last summer with his best friend by just using him to get ahead. He has to figure out the girl he's always wanted is an awful person, and that the one that he really wants, who is his other best friend, already has a boyfriend. Like I said, the story is simple, but it has moments of sweetness, relatability, and is almost always great comedy. Too few people have even heard about this show, and I recommend that anyone who has ever had that dream of living the life of fame, take a look at Zack Stone is Gonna Be Famous. You'll likely have a great time, and it might even remind you of that dream you buried when everyone told you you needed to grow up. But Cody, if it was so great, why was it cancelled after just one season? Good question, person who has a voice that sounds exactly like me. Zack Stone is Gonna Be Famous ran on MTV for one 12 episode season in 2013. Honestly, the lack of viewership just came from poor advertising. The only reason I ever found out about it and got to watch it is the fact that I'm a huge Bo Burnham fan. But other than that, I never even saw a commercial for it. Which is odd, because as you guys have probably figured out by now, I watch a lot of TV. I try not to be too commanding here, but seriously, give this one a look. And from Dead on Arrival on Nerd Central, this is Cody Nance saying, GET OUT OF MY KITCHEN! Thanks guys! The sponge who lives in a pineapple under the sea is getting a third film, but it won't be a continuation of the series and past films. The next SpongeBob SquarePants film will be titled The SpongeBob SquarePants Movie, It's a Wonderful Sponge, and will be an origin story about how SpongeBob met everyone in Bikini Bottom. The title is a clever nod to the 1946 Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. The film may have one thing going for it. The film's score will be composed by Hans Zimmer. You may know that name as the composer of the Dark Knight trilogy, Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman, and the first four Pirates of the Caribbean films. The film will be released on July 17, 2020. So Krista, first show is in the books, how do you feel? I feel pretty good, a little shook, literally, but it's okay. <laughs> it can be a little nervous your first time. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for this week's Nerd Central. Nerd Showdown is next. You can get caught up on all of the previous episodes on KNWT YouTube page. Also, follow KNWT on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and follow Nerd Central on Twitter at nerd underscore central underscore TV. A champion will be crowned in our best Pixar film tournament after the break. Stay with us.
Wait, does this mean you're replacing me? Uh, no. <laughs> And welcome to Nerd Showdown, the part of Nerd Central where we battle it out on a particular topic we have no business debating. I'm your host, Evan Vinzant, and with the Blu ray release of Incredibles 2 just around the corner, we ask the question to decide once and for all what is the best Pixar film? The winner of this showdown will be crowned champion of the Pixar Film Tournament. With me today, I have Bearcat Update producer Maria Babcock. Yay! <laughs> and Bearcat Update Channel 8 news reporter Nolan Brooks. Maria, why don't you start us off? Why do you believe Incredibles is the best Pixar film? Okay, there are several points that lead for, to Incredibles being the best Pixar film. One, I would say that it teaches kids to be superheroes um, and teaches them how to be tough. Like, it's very metaphorical, saying that they can do it, they just have to believe in, the, in themselves. Um, it's also very relatable to families. It's like your stereotypical um, American family. And, but it also, is super equal opportunity, I guess, when we like bring it to today, where um, you have the dad and then the mom could still do whatever she wants. She doesn't have to stay at home and take care of her kids. Um, also, it's a very quotable movie. For example, the honey, where's my super suit? That is definitely one of the most quotable things like from the movie and in general that I hear all the time. Um, it's very funny. I, I would say there's, even the villains who are supposed to be evil are also very humorous and a lot of the main characters are just humorous in general. You know, Toy Story, I feel like was Incredibles before Incredibles even came out. You needed a kids movie that, you know, brought toys to life and brought this imagination to life for kids. And I think that it really, really accomplished that. It, you know, brings this kid into his room where it's his safe haven, it's his heaven with his toys, and the toys are completely loyal to him, and that's just something that I feel like kids can relate to. And when they get that picture in their head, you know, then they go, they go out and buy these toys for this movie, and they think, oh, wow, what if my toys woke up? I know that's kind of scary, but what if my toys, like, started talking to me and just gave me this fun adventure all the time? I think uh, the casting for that movie was incredible. You have Tom Hanks voicing, uh, you got uh, Tim Allen voicing. I, I just think they did a great job overall of really bringing to life a kids movie that hits home for people before any other movie really did that overall. So, Toy Story, I would say, is a little scary for little kids, especially with Al like kidnapping toys and like um, abducting them and it talks about stealing that's not what you want to um, show to kids like that's not an example for them also I think it's a little overrated um, it's definitely the second one in the sequel so Incredibles is up here and then Toy Story definitely does not um, Toy Story 2 doesn't isn't doesn't get better from there um, it also talks about abandonment, and again, like that's not what we want a, a kids' movie to talk about. And then it's also very materialistic. Um, kids don't need to be, go out there and buy toys to have fun. Like that's not what they need to live by. Um, whereas Incredibles, they can just believe in themselves and like be tough and stuff. But uh, Toy Story, we don't need to go out there and buy toys just for them to have. I think Incredibles um, was trying to bring more quotable stuff after other movies did it, you know, Toy Story brought in You Have a Friend in Me songs and all that kind of stuff, and it really hit home for kids where I feel like Incredibles, although it did bring the superhero aspect, which is huge for kids, it wasn't, I feel, as relatable because it was more family-based and little kids aren't going to understand, you know, what it means to 
keep family close, be strong with your family, be close with your family, whereas in Toy Story, they can be close with their toys, as weird as that might sound again. They can be closer with their toys, and I don't think Incredibles really was hitting that message as much as Toy Story was overall, so. I feel like Incredibles, definitely, like when you're a little kid, you love your family, and Incredibles is fan, uh, fun and family loving. It's very relatable to a, a typical family. Little kids love their siblings, love their family, and you always look to be a superhero when you're little. Like when you ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oftentimes they say a superhero. Um, and I just think it's a very friendly, um, humorous, fun movie. I think Toy Story is the, is the best Pixar movie because uh, it's it's got that aspect of it where um, Kids can, like I said, they can bring up this relationship with, you know, having their toys, having a fun time, being able to be imaginative with anything in, in your room, having that safe haven. I also feel like Toy Story does, a, does that job for uh, little kids to realize that friends are important, even if it's just toys. Friends are always important. Keep your friends close, even when a new toy comes in don't judge them, don't shun them out because they're newer, a little bit better than you have more stuff. Always accept people and be nice to others because in the end, they're also, they're your family and that you want to keep them close. That is going to do it for this week's showdown. We got pretty heated this week, but I think the winner is Nolan. <laughs> Yay. Oh, yeah. uh, for his, his defense yes. of values and, uh, I don't know. I liked it better. <laughs> you can head to Nerd Central's Twitter to show your support for this week's showdown. Nerdmageddon is coming up next. You can check out Bearcat Update and Channel 8 News back to back starting at 6 p.m. See you next week on Nerd Central. Nerd Central.